in our midst, we have this very eminent scholar of planning and in particular housing. Um, and this is part, of course, of a series of talks that is sponsored by the um, Displacement Action and Research Network. Sophia's helping me. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, and in any case, I think that um, within this, we're, we're super delighted to have Larry here because in a way, his work represents uh, what planning scholarship can aspire to. I think many of us come into planning with a little bit of angst. So what is planning really about? <laughs> How are we distinct? How are we different from political science or economics or geography and, and architecture? Um, but if you look at Professor Lael's work um, over the course of his career, um, and in particular his work on public housing, it really represents what we can aspire to in terms of compiling the ways that the different disciplines come together, both in social sciences, and couple that with the physicality um, that we bring in planning, the physicality of how social science relationships translate um, into spatial forms via design and design politics. Um, so Larry's work is uh, especially informative on this scale within the purview of public housing um, and the United States experience, but I know lately has also um, he's also been looking at comparative experiences in Brazil and India. And there's a lot of value to that. Um, what is it that we can learn from comparative studies? Uh, traditionally, we can say things like, oh, it's great to study that which is similar and that which is different across borders. But on top of that, what we really want to understand is why are things similar and why are things different um, across borders, but also within the United States. And so in Larry's latest um, book, where he looks at Unquote, purging the forest um, in Atlanta and Chicago, what we really get a sense for is what are the, what's the evolution of the different rationalizations that have been used um, behind development and redevelopment interventions and planning, in, in, in particular in public housing. And I especially loved what you said at the end of your preface, which was that you, you were interested in measuring success, as opposed to simply critiquing failure. For me, uh, this is something that really distinguishes the scholarship that comes out of DUS uh, and planning faculty like I. Uh, it's really easy <laughs> to critique. It's really very hard to understand success. Um, and it's something that I know that you studied, uh, but it's also something that's very ensconced in politics. Um, how do you define success? How do you define failure? It makes me think about a conversation I had when I was working um, with the UN task force on slums, I went to the US State Department to get their feedback on our report. And we mentioned, I, I dared to mention US public housing history <laughs> to them. And uh, something that the response that I got uh, when, when I indicated that the US public housing system was perhaps a reference that we can learn a lot from internationally um, was uh, a reference to the 1980s book for Bonfire of the Vanities, uh, <laughs> which in short, not a good depiction, uh, not a good reaction to what I was indicating was something we can learn from. And so if I had a chance to go back five years, uh, what I would do is take out of the hands of the US State Department the Bonfire of the Vanities and put in their hands Professor Gallus' book. So, without further ado. <laughs> I knew that when we hired Gabriella last year, there would be a great purpose to this. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, such a, uh, an excessively uh, uh, encouraging introduction. I hope that I can live up to it, especially when I've been charged with talking about success and called the book Purging the Forest. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to hear about a couple of places that were pretty successful in purging the forest. <laughs> it was unfortunately uh, a consequence of trying to fit a, a story of seven cities into a book that got to 448 pages, I saw when it came out this week, um, that uh, really meant couldn't really fit all seven into it. So I've kind of postponed some of the cases that I think are a little bit more encouraging um, to the, the follow-on volume, um, which I am actively working on and, and very grateful to have the supports that I've had from some, some terrific uh, research assistants uh, here on that. Um, 
uh, though I will give a, a little preview at the very end of, of, uh, of slightly, uh, it doesn't have to be this way kinds of arguments because ultimately uh, I don't think we should be in the business of uh, purging the poorest uh, here in this country or in other places as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to Gabriella and also to Raj who uh, put together this series and will join us later after his class is over as well, uh, I think. Um, but so what, so what we have here is an opportunity uh, as illustrated by these, um, these two images um, to see what happens when poor people are removed from the scene. Um, you can see the play slides left. These are images from Camilo Vergara's uh, photographs and re-photographs re of the Cabrini Green uh, development in Chicago in 1988 and 1998 in the same place. And here's 2009, pretty much the same, uh, the next building over um, from it as well. And, um, and so what I'm trying to do uh, both in this book and in really the rest of my work is to, to ask what happens if you take the design side of planning and the social science and social political side of planning and put them together. Uh, and, and so it's what I call design politics um, that really is meant to be both aesthetic and socio-political. Um, and it's really, really asking in the case of, of transformations like this, what happens when you want to transform the, ne the, the symbolics, the negative image of a place at the same time as you're trying to um, replace the negative social aspects of a community? Uh, because really that's what, what has been happening in a, in a, lot, of, um, a lot of places. Uh, so, so the argument that, that I would make, uh, which is a little different than, than the way people tend to talk about public housing, uh, is that it's a kind of triple experiment. Uh, it's, it's not just uh, some bad thing that has failed uh, rapidly or slowly in lots of different places, but something that, that really could be parsed out a little more um, completely. So, so I think of it as in three phases with two, uh, two neighborhood renewal uh, interludes, I guess you could call them. Um, it's a counter narrative to the decline and fall narrative only, uh, which, which is going on. Um, and, and so we'll talk about the, the, the efforts uh, to kind of roll up the blueprints on top of the slums and build public housing. Then we'll, we'll have some talk about the the middle phase that might be called welfare housing, uh, and then the newer since 1990 phase that might be uh, clearing public housing and building mixed income communities. And a lot of the story, as, as I will suggest, can be told through the 75 year history of Cabrini Green in, in Chicago, um, which had um, a, a slum clearance origin, uh, and some of the areas that were designated as slums uh, looked like this, uh, wooden, and some of it looked a little bit more solidly built and presentable and brick-like. Um, but by the beginning of the 1940s had been transformed initially into a phase of uh, row houses over here. And then in the late 50s and early 1960s, another section uh, of, uh, extended to, uh, to build that much, uh, much further. Um, so it's an instance of what I call a twice-cleared um, community, this is the first instance. But what's happened in most of the older American cities, there have been instances where a neighborhood that is torn down uh, to build the brand new modern public housing has in turn had a, uh, a kind of second uh, clearance. Um, and it's, it's, a, you know, it's a question of whether this is just uh, seen as humanitarian aid to the poor living in places like this giving them modern accommodations, as, as the word has been uh, given out uh, publicly. But, but it's really not tended to be that, because those people that lived in these conditions were not welcome in those kinds of places. And that's the, that's the first point that I would make. Um, it's a sorting and evaluation system. It's a, it's a reward system for a particular kind of poor person uh, that has been judged worthy of the new housing while marginalizing others uh, based on, on things like race and ethnicity or family structure or earning capacity or anything like that. So there's an act of, of placement on the one hand, uh, the selection that lets you into one of these places when they were built, but also a displacement. Uh, and that's why we're here with the uh, displacement network um, to talk about it. And in, in these cases where it's happened twice, um, first the public housing uh, 
replacing the slums, and then uh, the, the public housing itself, judged to be slum-like in character, is being replaced uh, by something new. Uh, and these pictures of the townhomes uh, that are being built on the site of Cabrini Green are pretty much adjacent uh, to where that photo and that photo would have been taken just a few years uh, earlier. Um, so, so what I'm suggesting here, uh, you know, is not, a, I hope, a totally crazy idea of calling uh, a book about public housing purging the poorest. I mean, most people say, what is this guy talking about? Um, don't we all know that public housing is where all the poor people have been put? Uh, and and uh, this is not about purging the poorest, it's about consolidating them. Um, well, that might be true, but I think that's just the most written about middle phase. And so what I'm really trying to do is reframe uh, the way that we think about this problem. Um, and instead of saying the conventional notion uh, that, that it's going to improve low-income conditions uh, through housing and then, then fail to do what it was supposed to and ought to be torn down, um, I'm suggesting that there are actually uh, three phases. Uh, there's a phase that really was about purging the poorest people from the slums and not letting them back into the housing. Then there's the phase that people all know about, um, which I'm dating from the 1960 to about 1990, where there really has been a consolidating of poor people, uh, a sense where you, you get um, all of these, um, these efforts that, that followed in part on the, the rise of the welfare state that allowed more people to get some funding uh, to be brought into, uh, into this housing. Uh, and also the, the success of the civil rights movement that, that made it impossible to deny uh, people access to public housing on the basis of their race, and also uh, on the basis of single family, single parenthood. Um, so uh, lots of people starting in the 1960s that had been kept out by the, the gatekeepers of public housing because they were the wrong kind of poor person actually did get, get into it. Um, but then uh, people started uh, allowing the public housing to become increasingly um, underfunded and ill-maintained, and it led to a lot of the, uh, the kinds of collapses that we know. But I think there's also been a third phase that is trying in some ways to get back to the first phase um, since 1990 uh, through HUD's Hope 6 program, through other kinds of legislation that have taken place, um, and, and a variety of, of things like that that are trying to um, get us back to that. So what I'll be doing um, is, is really four things. First, a, a kind of introduction to the, the ways that public housing as we know it in the United States has really changed, especially in the, the last 20 years or so, and that we have a kind of outdated um, view of what counts as public housing. Um, second is, the, is to look at, at how people have responded to public housing and the changes that have happened. And then the third and longest part of this is about the two places that I've been looking at mostly in the, in the Purging the Poorest book, um, these twice cleared communities, uh, first in Atlanta and then in Chicago. And then at least briefly I want to say something about more positive cases where, where people have been trying not to purge the poorest when redeveloping public housing. Um, so one of the things that, that's uh, surprising to people uh, uh, at least if they haven't followed it, is that there are really two different kinds of, uh, of housing that gets called public housing. The, the rise of the conventional public housing, up to 1.4 million uh, of these, uh, these units that are owned and operated by housing authorities in the various uh, cities that were the only game in town up until the, the 1970s or so. Uh, and then the rise uh, since 1974 of the housing voucher um, that passes it in the early 1990s and now has about 2 million people with the, uh, the vouchers. This is the case where the, the subsidy travels with you to a private landlord and you can use it to subsidize the difference between 30% of your income and the, uh, the cost of the fair market uh, rental. Um, but it's a, so it's a reminder that the thing that we think of conventionally as public housing actually has declined from 1.4 million down to about 1.1 uh, million. And that's happened city by city uh, across the, uh, the country, that these, these lines, except for New York where it has never quite caught up, has happened um, fully. Uh, I don't think I have the most focused projector here, but it, uh, you'll have to take my word for, for what it's done. Um, and Atlanta and Chicago are really pretty extreme cases of this. Um, so you can see the, the growth of the public housing units up to about 15,000 by the end of the 1970s, and then it just plummeting 
uh, in the 1990s since. Meanwhile, the vouchers are kind of making up for it. Um, and then in Chicago, uh, the public housing gets very all the way up to 43,000 apartments. Uh, and then again, starting in the early 90s, starts dropping off uh, that way and has partly been caught up by the, the voucher movement. The other thing that's happened um, is that there are two kinds of projects. There's the, the, the things that are known as public housing and the things that have been privately developed and are more or less like public housing because they also provide a, a deep subsidy even though they've been privately developed and privately managed. Um, and uh, these, these numbers um, are almost never collected by cities. And this chart, like the last one, I've never seen actually until we put them in the, in the JAPA article in January. Um, but many cities uh, have more of the privately managed, uh, deeply subsidized public housing uh, than the public housing, the black bar here. Um, and, uh, and so it's, a, it's another reminder that over the last 25 years, uh, public housing conventional started as the most popular thing, but by the time we get to 2011, it's actually fourth out of four. The, the voucher system, the other housing, uh, private housing, and then the low-income housing tax credits that has sort of come shooting out of nowhere, but doesn't quite um, reach the lowest uh, incomes and doesn't give the same kind of deep subsidy in many cases uh, as possible. So, um, so if you were to um, uh, look at the, uh, at the trend and combine them, uh, we, we were doing okay up until the last 10 years or so, and then it's really just completely flattened out. Um, and, and then if you actually look at it in relation to the growth of the number of population and housing units that have happened from 1945 uh, to 2000, so there's you know, roughly two or three percent growth annually of the housing thing, and if you calibrate the percentage of that, uh, the rate of annual change uh, of the deeply subsidized housing, you can see that we're running ahead of the growth of the population up until recently, and now we're dipping below it. And so the, there, there is, I think, a crisis of deeply subsidized housing lack. Um, so, so there's our, our triple experiment. Um, but for me, the, the thing that's so interesting uh, about it and, and something that people fail to uh, uh, talk about is, is that public housing doesn't just emerge in the New Deal in 1935 out of whole cloth, out of nowhere. Um, it's something that people have been thinking about and worrying about um, as a basic question in the United States since, well, before the United States, all the way back to colonial times. The question of how does the, uh, how do the poorest people of the community live and where do they live and what is the role of the government, of the state, in helping them? Um, and what's, what's been fascinating to me, uh, and I explored this in an earlier, uh, an earlier book, um, thinking that I was going to write about public housing, but accidentally starting 300 years earlier, um, uh, is that there's this long um, tradition of, on the one hand, rewards, the sense that, that certain people who are upwardly mobile and hardworking will be given the, the largesse of the state because they're behaving well in housing terms, they're epitomized by the Homestead Act. And there's the sort of family that the Homestead Act was supposed to support. There's a stamp commemorating the centennial of the 1862 Housing Act. Uh, so you have the, the set of people that the government want to reward, the set of people that got uh, land for being veterans in the 19th century, that get favorable treatment uh, with single family home ownership starting in the early 20th century. The people who are really using uh, housing subsidy uh, in the way that the government most wants them to do. But on the other hand, there's an equally long, uh, an even longer tradition of, of housing as a kind of coping mechanism. Uh, this is the Alms House on Leverett Street in, in Boston, designed by Charles Bullfinch right after he did the, the State House. Um, it's, it's over near where Mass General was, although it was torn down. And it had a, a wing for men, a wing for women, and a chapel in between. And this is where people went, you know, when they, when they couldn't sustain themselves economically on the town, there was this grand edifice built on the edge of the, uh, the city uh, to, to try and house them. And it becomes a workhouse uh, uh, in, when they got some more land and moved it out further and further. 
Um, so, so you have these two long traditions of trying to say, well, there's some working people that we want to reward uh, and give them a house if they work the land for five years and, uh, and do what they're supposed to do, and there are others that we have to basically incarcerate um, uh, for, for the crime of being poor. Um, and it's, it's illustrated particularly well in one of my favorite books, uh, Civilization's Inferno, Studies in the Social Cellar by Benjamin Orange Flower from 1893. Think of it as the Boston equivalent of Jacob Rees's How the Other Half Lived, but without a lot of the good photographs. But he did have this illustration that really is about judging poverty. He said, well, well, the happy people are dancing in their townhouse uh, in, the, uh, in Boston. There are these successive layers of poverty that they're completely missing out. So they're the, they're the poor people out of work, the men out of work in the Depression of 1893, uh, then there are the worthy poor of widows and orphans that also can be trusted. And then there's the social seller, the kind of vicious poor uh, that can't be trusted and shouldn't be given the opportunity to uh, um, uh, have any kind of support uh, whatsoever. Um, so just a few years later, roughly 35 years later, housing authorities get established. And they actually call themselves the authority. <laughs> these, these are the guys of the Boston Housing Authority as of about 1940. Um, a group of five white men who decided which people got into public housing uh, and which people would, would not. Um, and, uh, uh, and so you get this, this uh, outpouring of efforts all over the country to suggest that public housing is going to replace uh, the slums. Uh, and, and you get uh, before and after kinds of images of police chasing delinquents in dark hued uh, things and sitting on stoops to happy women doing their housework next to the Boy Scouts in the new public housing. Um, and, and it goes on city by city. They're, they're all over the place. It's about clearing disease. It's about um, trying to, to move from one kind of uh, uh, unhealthy environment to a, a healthier one. It's about um, a kind of moral rescue, um, especially after uh, veterans got preferences at the end of the Second World War. Um, so, homes for heroes. Uh, instead of disease and fire and delinquency, you have health and safety and, and recreation. Uh, and you get these uh, extreme examples of, of, of people being uh, moved from darkness into the light. You know, they, this is an annual report of the Boston Housing Authority uh, from the uh, early uh, 1940s. And they've just built eight of these uh, public housing developments, and they're trying to make people feel like this is the, the great rescue from the darkness into the light. And it, it says, uh, it beheld eight clean, shining developments rising fresh to the sun, where once in dreary, dirt-filled, dilapidation, slum dwellings had shambled in contaminating hopelessness against a gray and somber sky. And suddenly the sun comes out, and the children are happy and well, uh, well dealt with. The, the Boston weather has improved everything all is well. Um, but I can tell you, you know, without a doubt, that those two kids were not in that alley before. Um, it just was not for the same people that were living in these conditions. And so when I did in, in the earlier work look back at, um, at, at what happened in the early public housing and actually tried to trace who got in and, and who was displaced, um, here's an example of a thousand units in the Charlestown district of, of Boston, uh, and uh, and that one, like several of the others, uh, 50 to 70 percent of the people actually registered their uh, interest in the new public housing. And then when one actually traces the records of who who got into them, it was between two and 12 percent that actually got in. Um, and uh, uh, it. It, you know, it's pretty much as the cartoon suggests that you know the, the slum guy, with slum clearance guy with his bag of tools, is going to get rid of disease, dispiritedness, and delinquency. We hope he'll be gone with the slums. Um, but he's not about to invite those people and their and all that they represent back into the, the new housing. Um, instead, there were all of these rules about who was the right kind of poor person that was to be there. They wanted families that were uh, the right race. Uh, for the neighborhood because there were neighborhood composition rules. They wanted households that were between two and nine persons, so you couldn't be a single individual, you couldn't be a large extended family, you couldn't be a gay or lesbian couple, you couldn't be unrelated individuals, uh, you couldn't uh, uh, be any of the things that uh, 
were not the preferred family type, uh, which would have been a young couple with a child or, or two, and maybe one on the way, uh, that kind of thing. And you couldn't be unemployed or on, on various aid because they wanted you to have a stable job that would enable you to reliably pay, pay the, the rent. Um, in many cities, uh, Boston certainly, and Chicago and others that I've looked at, about one out of 10 people could qualify to get in. You know, that's the level of scrutiny and apartment inspections and landlord references and all of these kinds of things that were, were there. Um, they were selecting people um, and rewarding people for public housing for that whole first phase of it. Um, it was not about consolidating poor people. It was about getting rid of one set of poor people uh, and, and finding a more reputable person, like the public citizen here shown in a, uh, in a um, uh, it's, it's a, a citizen of uh, Norfolk's Merrimack Park. So this is Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and what I find really, really interesting, uh, here, here it's a uh, boy uh, greets girl in a Brentwood Park home, all three look nice, right? So it's going to make your teenagers behave, behave well, too. But what was fascinating to me was that the, um, the people that are selected to go in uh, to this uh, here are saying, okay, 47,000 dwellings in Norfolk, Virginia. And out of those 47,000 of them, 17,000 are substandard. Um, and so you think, well, those are the people that you might want to move into public housing. Uh, but the, the reality of the diagram from their own annual report says 4,000 earn too much to live in public housing, so we don't want them. But 7,000 earn too little for public housing. They didn't want people who would be economic risks. They didn't want that kind of poor person. They, would, they want just this sort of middle ground uh, people that are for public housing. And that kind of thing was going on all over uh, the place. Um, and so it was a kind of in intended to be uh, a kind of social uh, progression uh, of slums to public housing to home ownership. Uh, here's another version of that. Um, even if the projector doesn't want to make that read readable. Um, so the first generation uh, of, of residents was selected to be onward and upward kind of movement. But then for all of the reasons that many of you are all too familiar with, uh, the, the kind of white working class and black working class that this was all intended for that were meant to be upwardly mobile, even if they had to be upwardly mobile in entirely separate and segregated institutions, um, stopped applying to public housing. Um, they had all sorts of other options. They had uh, uh, all of the things that were being done to facilitate home ownership and, and increased education and other kinds of things, especially in the suburbs and, and things like that. Uh, and so you get this long uh, protracted decline that um, most of the literature has focused on, ranging from Lee Rainwater and the studies of Pruitt-Igo before it was destroyed in St. Louis, uh, to Arnold Hirsch's Making the Second Ghetto in, in Chicago, and then the journalist Alps Kotlowitz that did There Are, are No Children Here um, that, are, that are there. So um, public housing essentially then gets reinvented in that second social experiment that I described as welfare housing. So it, instead of it being the way of purging the poorest and welcoming the upwardly mobile poor, it now becomes, uh, in some cases enthusiastically, some cases reluctantly, a place to put the poorest uh, and to consolidate that. But even then, it was completely non-standardized. Um, uh, non so you can get in the same year, 2008-2009, uh, uh, one book about the Chicago Housing Authority called Blueprint for Disaster, um, The Unraveling of Chicago Public Housing by Brad Hunt, and then Nick Bloom talking about a place with larger housing stock, more high-rises, all the things that you say you can't do that's called public housing that works. New York in the 20th century. And he's not saying New York in the 1930s, um, uh, though in Chicago, when public housing was paradise, it's talking about the 30s and 40s and early 50s. Uh, the argument here is that New York actually made it work uh, with all of the buildings that you say you can't manage and you can't uh, uh, live in, uh, made it work, work better. So it's not an inevitability, and, and that's why we have to look very place-specific uh, kinds of things. So after all of these decades of people doing the doom and gloom studies, um, the last 15 years or so, um, or at least a dozen or so, uh, have really been trying to rethink this and to really look at the role of designers, the role of tenant activists, 
and the role of others that, that have had more proactive uh, kinds of, of things. So you get a book like The Dignity of Resistance, Women's Residence Activism in Chicago Public Housing, uh, Roberta Feldman and Stu Susan Stahl, or Rhonda Williams' book, The Politics of Public Housing, Sudhir Venkatesh uh, explaining the complexity of gang life in Robert Taylor Holmes' mm -hmm. American Project. Um, this book, uh, pondering where are poor people to live in Chicago when, uh, when public housing gets torn down. Um, in my own book on Boston, Reclaiming Public Housing is in that. So, um, so here is where tenant uh, activism has mattered a lot uh, in many cases. And in each of the two cases that I want to turn to now, uh, the tenants were very active. Uh, the ones in, in Chicago uh, got a lot more than the ones in Atlanta. Uh, in part because the Chicago folks had a lot better legal uh, connections um, and work with the um, legal aid bureaus. But ultimately, these are cases uh, where the residents lost pretty badly and have been losing uh, so as well. So, so first is the Atlanta story. Um, uh, what was described in, in one early photo as low-cost living in the very shadow of the downtown business trip. So they're really saying, well, who deserves that? Who deserves to live in the shadow of the downtown? Uh, they wanted those well-selected, carefully picked, um, selective, collective. And how long did they get to stay there? You know? um, so the residents resisted their displacement when it did, when it did start to come. There, the, there was very little opportunity to resist it when the slums were cleared to build this, uh, and a little bit more when the public housing was cleared in the 1990s. Um, but, but really, Atlanta has been trying uh, to get rid of its family public housing um, to build this on top of what it called the Tech Flats slum in the late 30s and 1940s, and then uh, 60 years later to build Centennial um, Place on top of the public housing uh, right after that. And it goes back to these, um, the sense that the slums were strangling the city, and particularly strangling the downtown. So this gray area here, uh, from a 1950 map is suggesting that the downtown is there, and specifically there is the state capitol and city hall right to it. So symbolically, these things were the worst possible living conditions next to the most prestigious uh, organs of the government, and they wanted to try and figure out how to, how to do that. And, and so they did all sorts of statistics, uh, uh, and there's a design politics to those statistics. Um, they wanted to uh, believe in the transformative power of design to get you out of a situation where a slums of the city could yield 5.5% of the tax revenues but have 39% of the population. And meanwhile, 39% of the population is charging the city with 53% of the costs and 72% of juvenile delinquents and 48% of the crimes. So they were saying slums cost too much money. Um, we can't afford slums, therefore we turn them down. And they brought in this man, uh, Charles Palmer, Chuck to his, his friends, whose, <laughs> self, uh, whose memoir was appropriately titled Adventures of a Slum Fighter. Um, and so Chuck Palmer, who held the largest amount of uh, privately owned real estate in the South, according to some calculations, had his uh, office downtown right here. And he had just purchased in the early 1920s uh, a home in the all-white Brookwood Hills subdivision at the North. And he had a pretty easy commute, straight down here, except when he got to this point, right around here. And he, he, he talks about in his memoirs how upset he got every time he, he, um, he drove past this, this area that was a kind of lowland slum area. Uh, and eventually, he devotes his life to this, and he becomes, uh, uh, from a, an anti-Roosevelt Republican, becomes this avid New Dealer, and even uh, becomes the head of the Housing Authority in the late 30s and eventually gets the federal government post uh, during the war uh, to oversee some of the, the, the housing. Uh, so he's transformed by the idea of, of doing some of this. But he goes to this, uh, this place initially and, and finds this, uh, this area that only Anne Spurn could approach, uh, I think appreciate fully. Uh, because what you see here is the lowland area where the creeks have come through down here. And this was this black community living in terrible conditions in an area known as Techwood Flats. Um, and sure enough, they pick this as the site of, of Techwood Homes over here. And you can even see the outline of the Techwood Drive that bends right here, just as the stream did over here. And here's a photo that I found that showed what happened when it flooded uh, years later, even after the <coughs> public housing uh, was, was built. 
Um, so, you know, there, there is a, a, a racial topography to this uh, that turns out to be very important to the, uh, the story. Um, so this design politics of, of race, or maybe it's erase uh, in this case, um, uh, is, is particularly fascinating to me. So, so Chuck Palmer, in his memoir, um, retroactively claimed that he cleared a white neighborhood uh, to build Techwood. So this is the neighborhood he claimed to be cleared to build this side of it first. Um, and he writes, uh, from my cursory and hesitant glances at these huddled structures, it seemed improbable, but the records revealed that nearly a thousand white families were jammed into this slum. This, this slum. Um, and, uh, and so uh, he, he has just uh, ignored the fact that the lowland area that had the black population in it had been cleared, um, and, and retroactively convinces himself that he actually cleared a white neighborhood because he looked at census tracts that were like way out here uh, and then could, could uh, claim that he'd actually uh, cleared it. But this is the neighborhood that he actually had, had cleared. Um, and, uh, and here is uh, the, the black community that was really removed out of Techwood, Techwood Flats. Um, here's an internal uh, view of one of the, uh, the places. And instead, he, uh, he lands on this, uh, this particular photo um, to, to make the, the case uh, as, as, uh, as best as possible. So let me just read a, a passage from the, the memoir um, where at the beginning of this he's describing his first visit in 1933 on his commute to go look at this and, and see what, what he finds. And, and he describes um, the scene. It was early morning. Behind a shack, a simple-minded girl lackadaisically split kindling, kindling wood watched by a listless group of children. A white-haired woman hunched over a rusty wash tub. Ragged quilts were being aired on broken crates. A chamber pot held, hung beside a water dipper. A worn mop was suspended from the remnant of lattice on a sagging porch. I had brought along a camera and took a picture quickly, but the tenants didn't seem to mind. They were past caring, licked by their surroundings. I turned back to my car. I'd had enough. Um, and then I found the corresponding photograph in the Palmer archive. Uh, and discovered, wait a minute, I know he cleared a black community. Everything I've seen is there. Why is this photo uh, showing all of these white people? And sure enough, the, the site is cleared in 1934, and the back of the photo is dated June 1936. So he's, he's used this, he's just completely convinced himself that he's cleared one, um, one community uh, when in fact he's done something uh, very different. Um, and in fact, um, when one actually looks at what happens, not surprisingly, none of the black side of the community were welcomed in what became a doubly all-white project afterwards. But only 8% of the poor whites that lived on the site that became Clark Howell homes on the, uh, on the west side of it came back either, because they were not the kinds of poor people that the housing authority wanted to house. They were not going to pass any of these selection criteria uh, that were there because they wanted to have upwardly mobile people who could um, fit the family arrangement. So the photographs of people coming in, here's the, the white couple entering uh, one of the Techwood apartments um, in the late 1930s. Uh, so black people did get in, but only if they were carrying white people's furniture. Um, that's about the extent uh, of, uh, of uh, integration that was possible in that era. Um, this was a whites-only pool of tenants, literally and figuratively. Um, and, and even when they did build public housing for blacks separately uh, in other parts of the, the city, um, uh, it didn't even register on the cover of the uh, annual report. Um, it's all the great buildings of Atlanta and Stone Mountain above it all, um, and, uh, and then public housing interspersed in with a greater Atlanta. And then this picture of sound bodies, sound minds, sound morals of the happy white children. They did occasionally put pictures of black people in, but the caption here says of these, these two, uh, these Negro children have been scrubbed till they shine, and are they happy? Exclamation point. Maybe not. Um, uh, here, a zoning map. We know what zoning maps. They have residential, they have commercial, they have industrial, they have schools, they have parks. They have areas chiefly occupied by Negroes. It's, it's completely a category of land use um, by, by race. Um, and, uh, 
And what you have here is a railroad track over here, and where Clark, Powell, and Techwith are in one of these areas where there's some hatched lines that showed black occupancy that had gone into this part of Atlanta. So one of the things that's going on here is reclaiming a section of the city for white occupancy. Um, uh, and meanwhile, it's all marketed as a, a kind of design politics of progress. Um, the, the, the sorts of people on the way up, as the caption says, uh, that have gone from this to this, even though those people never live there, I'm sure. Um, and, and this is the kind of graphics that went with it. Um, the images of who is eligible for continued uh, admission, admission and continued occupancy. Um, uh, again, this is what public housing meant in that first phase. Um, it was the best security for civilization. And, and Chuck Palmer, uh, shown in a sketch, I found this in one of his own books, I think it was probably a gift from somebody else, was Paul Revere Palmer to the rescue. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and unfortunately, uh, afterwards, uh, the public housing really, while it may look nice in, a, in an image from 1980, uh, was increasingly being disinvested in, and, uh, and increasingly subject to a lot of, uh, of crime uh, and all of the things that I was describing that, that caused public housing to decline. So by the early 1980s, this woman was part of a group that was called the Bat Patrol. Um, and once public housing at Techwood shifted in the, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s from all white to almost entirely all black, um, once the uh, civil rights movement had hit and the housing authority was forced to desegregate its projects, um, there, there was just very little uh, revenue coming in. And these people, uh, as the paper story that uh, went around it, were forced out of their home by drug dealers and other things in, in the late 1980s. Um, and so starting in the 1990s, there were movements uh, to try and uh, redevelop the, uh, the housing. Um, they had one tenant group that was uh, the residents that were trying to work with the housing authority to get a plan, and another group that called themselves uh, Tenants United for Fairness, or TUF, uh, were, were trying to uh, suggest that they were not going to be adequately served by the, the initial plan that the housing authority had put forward uh, with the developer in 1991. Uh, and then meanwhile, just as this is starting to happen, the Olympics get announced. So Atlanta, out of, out of a big surprise, uh, is offered the Centennial Olympic Games for 1996 um, in 1990, and then everything starts to change immediately. Um, uh, because they decide, well, what a great idea. We can use the coming of the Olympics to accelerate the change in public housing in these kinds of neighborhoods that could be desirable. So immediately adjacent to Georgia Tech, uh, immediately adjacent to downtown, is this declining public housing uh, development, and they get the idea of putting the Olympic Village uh, on and across the street from the public housing. Um, so uh, by the time uh, this picture was taken in 1944, most, uh, 1994, most of this is boarded up and, uh, and starting to be abandoned. And the idea was that by the time the Olympics uh, would come, it would be almost impossible uh, to see any signs of public housing residents by, by 1996. So uh, here uh, is the site of the part of Techwood, the four acres that gets turned over uh, to public, uh, to, to the Olympics to, to put um, that building for the Olympic athletes into that part of the site. Uh, and here, here it is down here. And then they tear down all of the public housing near it in advance of the uh, Olympic Games. So that if you actually could, could read this at the, at the chart, from 100% uh, occupancy or near 100% occupancy at the moment when Atlanta is chosen for the Olympics, by the time there's actually a plan accepted, 70% uh, of the Techwood tenants are actually already out of the, the housing. Um, and, uh, and that's probably you know, getting to be where they start counting of who, who is eligible to, to return. So you know, it's, a, it's a really important kind of thing. So you have this site that is now uh, seen not as the unwanted lowlands of tech flats, but as this place that's between Georgia Tech uh, and Centennial Olympic Park and downtown and the Georgia Aquarium that gets built and the world of Coca-Cola and the future civil rights uh, movement uh, museum and the Coca-Cola world headquarters uh, up here. Um, 
And as soon as the Olympics get out, they, you know, they get announced, this is what, what goes on. Uh, this fellow, Norman Johnson, who was a special assistant to the Georgia Tech uh, president um, and later a, a school committee leader, uh, says, you know, here's, the, here's what he told the major newspaper. There's one of the finest international corporations. And, and two, here's one of the finest technological institutions. And here's one of the world's best cesspits. Uh, it doesn't play well. Um, uh, and then uh, Rene Glover, who takes over as the housing authority, um, said to the tenants in, in 1995 at a meeting that was attended by an anthropologist who uh, did some really interesting work uh, at the time, it's not being done because the Olympics are coming, it's facilitated because the Olympics are coming. It's a pretty fine distinction to make. Uh, when I asked her about it uh, a few years later in 2010, uh, she, she said, you know, all the world's TV cameras are going to be there. You couldn't help but ask, well, I know we're here at the Olympics, but what the heck is that over there? So something had to be done. Um, and she described it as a, you know, a, a God-given thing. Um, uh, and so the Olympic dreams that, that happened uh, in this place were, uh, were not for the residents of Techwood and Carcal. Um, so instead of this over here, and there were 1,117 people, the households there, when the Olympic planning began. Um, by the time Centennial Place opens and finally finishes tenanting its, its uh, last phase in 2000, seven, 78 households, or 7% of the total, actually uh, returned uh, to it. And they only built 300 units of public housing on the site, so there was never going to even be a possible thing. So you get this. Um, uh, very poorly designed set of parking lots, I, I would you yeah. know, um, uh, masquerading in a new urbanist design um, uh, that, that can be photographed well from the street, but it's really about providing lots of gated parking in the center of the, the blocks. Um, uh, and, and you get a lot of people that, that just aren't invited to come back. And it's because of what's going on. I mean, look at the corporate views from both directions, from the remnants of the, public, the, the new public housing and the remnant building that they saved as a sap to historic preservationists and then didn't put anything into it. Um, the downtown towers, the Coca-Cola towers, um, this is what you see in that direction um, here, and that's what you see in that direction uh, here. Um, it's, it's really everywhere, you know. The old slogan, things, uh, things go better with Coke. Um, some things go better with others. Um, so, um, meanwhile, uh, they, uh, Rene Glover and company simply said that the people who were in this public housing would be better off with vouchers, uh, and the, the, uh, um, but didn't start counting who was eligible until a lot of people who had been lost to the, the system. And we can talk about whether that was a good, a good thing. So here's a reminder of what happens to public housing. Uh, and Renee Glover has been in, in office for now 17, uh, nearly 20 years. Um, uh, and they, they claim that there's more than ever. But if, if you look, if you took the total of them, it actually starts declining in the last uh, 10 or 15 years as well. Uh, and they even started tearing down the housing for seniors, which is usually not seen as the same problematic. So, so here is Renee Glover and uh, a grandmother and granddaughter that are about to implode it while a lot of white people watch near Georgia Tech. Um, and, and so uh, the place that had been there and named after Franklin Roosevelt, who had inaugurated this housing in 1935 uh, as the first public housing in the whole country, uh, Roosevelt House, it was fast. Uh, and Georgia Tech president, before the dust is cleared, and, uh, and his wife heard, he seemed to be enjoying their neighbor's implosion. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a tough story. Um, uh, and Chicago has a similar one. Um, uh, Chicago, Cabrini Green gets cleared um, in the 30s to the 50s. The middle phase is when it's, when it's built and, and occupied. Uh, and then it's been 20 years now of trying to figure out how do you redevelop this, that has been almost as hard to do as anything else. So it's the famous area of the Gold Coast and the, and the slum, um, where even insanity rates, as measured by the Chicago School sociologists uh, of the early 20th century, uh, suggest that there are some very sane people right here and some very insane people just to the west of them uh, in the uh, area of the slum. Uh, or here, um, that the kinds of places of poverty and places of philanthropy. They mapped who was giving money and who was uh, receiving it. Um, 
But most of all, they were interested in, in understanding all of the crime that was going on. So these are two images I found from some early 20th century newspapers. Um, because between 1910 and 1930, this district um, that was known colloquially as Little Hell um, had at its core a place that was widely called Death Corner. So the corner of Oak Street and Milton over here, and every one of those dots is a place where a man was murdered um, in, in the 1914 up above and 1916 down above. So here is Where Guns Pop, a diagram of Little Hell, every dot indicating a murder since January 1 last. Um, so it's just this uncanny um, coming together of this. A uh, hundred of these were unsolved murders, and by the 1920s, there were 30 a year going on. Um, by, the, by the 20s, it gets involved in the alcohol rivalries and Al Capone and all of those kinds of, of gangs uh, there uh, as well. Um, and uh, arguably, it was more dangerous and more deadly than the infamous Cabrini Green that we know uh, now. Um, you know, and the, the newspapers took incredible prurient interest in, in trying to figure out how the so-called black hand was operating. So here's the man with his sniper rifle hiding uh, under the stairs and shooting the people in conversation on the, on the corner of, of uh, Milton and Oak uh, that, that are there. So it's not surprising um, that, that people, when you hit the depression and are looking for things to do and spend money on uh, for, for jobs and things like, like that, um, talk about clearance um, and trying to get rid of places. Uh, this is a really extreme diagram, though. Um, if you look at the figure at the center, it says 36 square miles to be rebuilt here. You know, you know not 36 acres, um, 36 square miles um, What is what was intended. So there's downtown surrounded by hobo land, as it's listed over here, and then 7,300 substandard buildings must be wrecked very soon in this area. And this is sort of about where the green, green might be. Um, this is the kind of image. And, and so their goal is to just simply get rid of that neighborhood that had been causing uh, so much trouble. Um, and, and it was largely an area that was starting to get black infiltration into the north side. So everywhere you see a, a, a coded race of residents thing in a, in a map that, that I did of the 1930 manuscript census, um, is showing um, that this is not the, the, the white uh, Italian Chicago that they had grown up with, um, but, but a changing neighborhood, and the housing authority is trying to control and manage some of that. Um, they have the same kinds of diagrams that were going on in, uh, in Atlanta about slums versus non-slums and all the dangers of that. Um, but it was added uh, with a layer of race and ethnicity that was quite active. This is uh, Father Luigi Giangastiani, who was the um, head of the, the parish church that had been there um, for decades, and he actually lasted there until the 1960s. Um, and here he is at the rubble of the neighborhood that is being torn down. And he was absolutely furious that this was an area that was allowing non-Italians and particularly non-whites uh, to come into it. So it's a time when Italians themselves are struggling over racial and ethnic identity and incredibly uh, intolerant uh, at this particular situation of what was going on. So he writes a letter to Elizabeth Wood, the executive secretary of the Chicago Housing Authority, uh, that says, the cohabitation or quasi-cohabitation of Negro and white um, must be condemned because it hurts the feelings and traditions of the white people of this community. By this cohabitation, the Negroes might be uplifted, but the whites, by the very laws of environment, feel that they will be lowered. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, we, that, that people were up to. This is what it meant to be choosing who got in and who got moved out. Uh, this is what was meant uh, by displacement. Uh, flowers grow where slums once stood, but a whole lot of other stuff was growing there. You know, that was what the environment was, was about. And, and replacing this, this neighborhood that did have some uh, multiracial communities with, a, with an almost entirely white uh, row house project uh, introduced by Robert Taylor, who was the African-American chair of the Chicago Housing Authority and the, the son of the Robert Taylor that was the first black graduate of the architecture department, first black graduate of MIT, um, I, 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 and, and the person who was the name Robert Taylor Holmes later, later came. So, so the one black person that, that is here in a place that really was struggling to make an integrated place because Elizabeth Wood, who was the 
who lost her job in trying to defend uh, against segregation, se segregated housing, uh, while, while leading the housing authority, did manage to put some uh, black people into this uh, development, and then increasingly it changed um, as the neighborhood began to change. So simply, Death Corner and Little Hell is replaced by the Francis Cabrini homes, and then they had a plan to take the rest of the area uh, that had to wait until after the war. Um, and in 1950, uh, they made clear the, the racial issues that were going on here. So here is the area where Cabrini Green is, and it was mapped as this, this black spot in an otherwise white neighborhood. Uh, this is an area that had 90% black by this point in 1950. And they're basically saying, we need to start controlling who is allowed into this neighborhood. Um, and this is, a, this is the change, racial change between 1939 and 1950. So they're trying to manage that uh, through the housing authority, um, and did so by extending Cabrini and then adding the green homes across Division Street, which ironically became a gang uh, uh, border as well, because somehow they assigned these people to go to one school and these people to go to another school, uh, and then had a street that was called Division. Um, and then the, these are all red brick buildings and these are all white buildings. So these were called the, the reds and those were called the, the whites. And there's a long story in the rap dictionary if you ever want to get the details on how every building uh, got a nickname uh, uh, about this. But meantime, these are all built, uh, as I suggested, in that phase one period of, of real high hope for, for, for rewarding people. And if you look at some of the, the statistics behind it, um, when, when 1950 happens, um, this is the percentage of Chicago median income in 1950. So it's like uh, almost 60% of the area median income of Chicago is who's coming to Cabrini Green um, when it's built. Um, so these are low income, but they're not a very low income or extremely low income. They're this, this upwardly mobile side of the poor. But then it starts declining and declining and declining by 1980, 20% of the area median income. Um, and then it goes even further. So you have these, st these statistics that are coupled with incredible bouts of, of violence after 1968 and the uh, King assassination that was um, received very poorly. Uh, King had spoken a few months earlier at, in, at, in Chicago at, at a church right next to Cabrini Green and was a very beloved figure there. And even though all the discussion is about riots on the south side and the west side, and um, the third area of unrest was actually right around Cabrini Green. And the housing authority in the, in the 1970s was trying to market this uh, as, uh, don't, you know, we're gonna, we got this, we're under control here. Uh, there's a lot you don't know about the improvements. And it's really an attempt to try and get people willing to live in a place that, that was there. Uh, they brought in uh, a private developer, uh, Vince Lane, who posed for the Chicago Tribune on top of Cabrini Green uh, here, and was meant to be the, the savior of, uh, of the Chicago Housing Authority. And they tried uh, everything that was possible, uh, the, the famous uh, sweeps of, of the uh, apartments that were intended to, uh, uh, to rid drug dealers and guns and things like that. They spent something like a half a billion dollars uh, and never really managed to uh, improve a lot of uh, the conditions there. And then two things happened. Um, the first was the absolutely tragic murder of Daniel Davis, a seven-year-old uh, who was simply trying to walk, holding his mother's hand from an apartment on one side of the street to his school on the other side of the street and was shot by a, a sniper. Hundreds of newspaper stories to this day have been written in Chicago about this. It was a tremendous turning point in the outrage and the willingness to act uh, about public housing. It was also uh, almost uncannily timed with the origin of the Hope Six program, um, so that there became a, a, uh, a funding mechanism very soon. But even, even stranger is when I actually uh, followed up on a little hunch about Death Corner uh, and discovered Daniel Davis was shot 200 feet from the erstwhile Death Corner from the early part of the 20th century. Um, the killing ground of, of Chicago had been the killing ground uh, eight decades earlier as well, just 200 feet uh, apart. So the development community gets very involved in this um, and says, well, we're not going to just replace public housing, we're going to replace the whole neighborhood. So the Near North uh, Neighborhood Initiative starts in, in 1996 and um, 
and it's a billion dollar initiative of, of shopping centers and other kinds of things. Bits of Cabrini are still shown here and, and here, but much of it is to be completely taken over. The row houses are still there, at least temporarily. And so one by one, there's been these, these series of new developments that, that have happened initially on the fringes and then starting to be on the, the site within the boundary itself uh, since the 1990s. Um, and uh, and uh, the goal was to put 10 or 15 percent quotas of, of residents into the, each of these new developments that would be there. And then a couple of them, like Northtown Village here and Parkside of Old Town here, I think love the names, uh, get to be 30 percent uh, former uh, Cabrini residents. So the idea is to reinvent uh, public housing in that third phase uh, as mixed income housing. Um, and to completely uh, integrate it um, by color. So the yellow are the market ones, uh, the, uh, the blue are public housing, uh, and the, the red are tax credit units that are sort of inter interspersed that, that were there. Um, they sold the first 47 of these in, in the year 2000 in, in seven hours. Um, 60 Minutes went and did a, a segment uh, uh, on it, and they, they quote these, um, this young white couple saying, it was just a feeding frenzy in there. I mean, everyone was screaming and yelling. One lady yelled at her husband, just buy whatever's left. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You know, um, uh, you got to see this. It's, it, the, the, the 60 Minutes episode is actually up on the developer's website because they, they like this. Um, it was much harder to find the 79 units of public housing residents to move into this. Uh, and the developer, who is a really wonderful guy, Peter Holston, uh, who has just tried to do everything that you can do in this situation, and constantly just has hit barrier after barrier, uh, really trying. Um, but even, even Peter says, um, we were just given a whole bunch of names to look at by the housing authority, and we sort of picked and chose the best. And then he told me, about one in five work out OK. Um, so in other words, they want to bring back public housing, but they also want to maintain the standards that the developers are expecting for the property. Uh, and those two things uh, are not going to really match in every case. So, so the change is coming to Cabrini, um, the, these developments that are, that are going on uh, around it. Um, this man, um, who, who told me his, his name was uh, Pookie, uh, actually got one of the spaces. But when I asked if I could take his picture at the end of our interview, uh, you know, he just started saying, you know, I don't get it. All these white people and their little dogs, and they just went like that. And I said, all right. Um, and that's, uh, this is what he was reacting to. Um, uh, and, uh, but he got a place in it, so he's, you know, allegedly one of the winners uh, in, in something like that. And this kind of thing uh, is growing up uh, all around it, um, where, where little bits of public housing residents are, are brought back in, uh, and then on the site itself, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's trying to get um, these kinds of buildings replaced by, by townhouses. This one says $499,000 to $850,000 for townhomes, condos in the 300s uh, sales center park side of Old Town. Um, that's the kind of thing. But but it's a place that had 3,600 units of public housing when it was uh, started in the 1990s, when it, when it was all finished. And now 20 years into the development, there are only 400 units of public housing uh, that have been uh, brought back into that area and its neighborhood. Um, and, uh, and about 700 projected, but, but, but unclear when that will, will happen. Um, as, as tends to happen, Starbucks comes in first. You can still see the tower next to it in 2000. Uh, by, by 2009, it's got the, the condos in, because the best of Chicago is in your, your backyard. Um, but unfortunately, um, they got phase one open just about the worst possible time. So once again, Peter Holston is the developer who's tried to build this mixed income experiment. And, and what happens is uh, uh, people either pull back their deposits and can't, uh, can't afford to, to buy the, the places once the, the market uh, uh, is, is crashing, or they bought them and they can't sell them. Um, and so you have this situation where they're intending to have 30% uh, public housing and 50% market rate and 20% with tax credits in between. And instead, um, you're getting the public housing people moving back in for their share and the market rate people pulling out. Um, and, and you get this incredible uh, 
uh, class and racial conflict that emerges um, when, when that happens. So they, they had to cut prices on the market rate. This is the ad that, that was referred locally as the scream. Um, and she's delighted that the prices have been reduced, but a lot of the other people were screaming on the site for, for very different, uh, different reasons. Um, so there's where you have it. Um, you, you have uh, Dantrell Davis's murder, uh, the Death Corner site, and phase two of Parkside of Old Town, all in the same place. Um, uh, the Chicago Housing Authority is trying to reinvent itself. Um, they, they hired a, a very reputable pro bono uh, uh, job from a real, uh, marketing firm uh, to rebrand themselves as uh, change, taking the CHA uh, to, to kind of uh, explain that this was the new, the new CHA. It took about two months before a group of rogue artists uh, <laughs> uh, commandeered the whole poster design uh, scheme that were on buses and everything else and even invented a, their own uh, website. They got www.chicagohousingauthority.net. Um, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was shut down. And then they made fun of the mayor and the uh, head of the housing authority and the head of HUD and the developer. You know, are tourists more important than the poor? Richard J. Gailey, you know. And, and they did this, this whole uh, kind of, of, of story. And, uh, and it you know, just got people um, kind of riled up. Uh, this, this guy um, took a group of planners from the uh, ACSP conference around the, the world houses. Uh, his name is uh, J.R. Fleming, uh, and he had his own version of what the, uh, the acronym uh, stood for. I hope this is not too loud. It's going to take about five seconds here. Uh, here's what he thinks changes. Um, so, so you get a tremendous amount of, of, of community opposition, uh, and you get back to this old 1930s style language about blight. Um, you know, this is this is 2009 here. Uh, demolish any buildings that are a blight to the community, and you have a language about blight describing physical structures, but you have a social and political reality that is overlaid with that. Uh, and then what the, what really drew the uh, the residents even more uh, into upsetness uh, was the announcement last year that the part of the uh, green homes was going to be replaced by a large uh, Target store um, uh, instead of new housing. Um, and uh, so it just sort of permanently extends the period where, where long promised and long litigated uh, efforts to bring back new housing have been um, delayed. Uh, and. Uh, you know, they had the reds and the whites of the projects, and now they have the reds and the whites of the target sign, but it's not the same thing. Uh, for good reasons and for bad reasons. All of this is ambiguous, because this was, these were troubled places. Um, the trick is trying to figure out how do you replace troubled places in a way that doesn't discriminate against people who have suffered from living in neglected places. Um, all over the city this is happening in the plan for transformation. Uh, and, you know, they, they act as though if you build it, uh, they will come, but as of October uh, 2012, uh, Parkside of Old Town that got up to 67% occupancy is doing much better than all of the rest of these, except for Jazz on the Boulevard on the south side. Um, a lot of these places have really struggled uh, to find their, their home. But here we are, 20 years into uh, redevelopment and uh, 3,600 units of public housing in a prime area is down to 400, and they just announced they want to redo the row houses into mixed income housing. So those have been uh, gradually being emptied of the people in, in, in those uh, as well. Um, and uh, and the, the housing authority will, will give you a different story. Um, they will issue reports like this one, uh, the plan for transformation and update on relocation in April 2001, and, and suggest that Cabrini uh, here, uh, located here, have actually scattered people to all sorts of parts of the, the city. Um, but it's still uh, disproportionately into low-income parts of the city. And in those who actually look at the figures will spin it one way, depending on whether they're trying to support the housing authority, and spin it another way when they're trying to say that people have moved from 
concentrated poverty in public housing to a only slightly less concentrated poverty in the various neighborhoods. Um, but the thing that really the, the thing that really bothered me about this um, was that they give this very nice pie chart that suggests, well, you know, here where are they now? Forty-five percent uh, got vouchers. Uh, Thirty-five percent of them are in mixed-income housing developments. This is, a, this is just the Cabrini Green residence, and 20% are in traditional uh, CHA housing. But, but it's, it misses what I call the design politics of the baseline. Um, if you're talking about a development effort, it matters when you start counting and why you start counting and who you start counting um, to know um, how many of the people you're actually talking about. Um, given that there, that there are only 400 families that have been put into these mixed income populations, um, that's not 20, um, that's not 35% of the people who live there. Um, you know, they had 3,600 families who had been there, right? So it's sort of when do you start counting? You can do wonderful graphs and wonderful use of, of, of mapping, but it depends on what the assumptions you're bringing into the data are uh, and what you're trying to show with it. Um, so uh, just to, to come to a closure here, the, um, the, the conclusions of, uh, of the Housing Authority has uh, this big plan for transformation that has, has really started to lose uh, units at the end. They don't want to tell you that, but um, it you know, once had 43,000 apartments, and now they're about half that, um, that, that, are, that are there. And in the context of, of losing um, what we, you know, that we're falling behind the, the replacement uh, of, of housing, the, the, the rate of housing that, that really is um, a percentage that, the percentage of housing that is uh, deeply subsidized has been declining in the last 20 years or so and is now falling behind the rate of, of the growth that I showed this before. Uh, and then, um, just to make matters worse, people say, well, you know, at least you've given them all vouchers. And any of you who have been following the news in the last couple of weeks have seen report after report, city after city, saying, uh, wait a minute, sequestration means that you need to cut back on your vouchers because your housing authority can't afford to house those people with vouchers. And because the vouchers are so vulnerable uh, to cut back, this is the projection that came out on April 2nd, 140,000 uh, nationwide, uh, according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. So ultimately, um, I think there, there are some options that are, that are better. Um, and just, just a word at the, at the end here to, to talk about what that might be. Um, the first is what I would call fixing without mixing. Um, investing in, in public housing and doing a lot of the things that, that actually have brought these things back, um, as it's been done in Boston, or trying to, to replace one for one the public housing that you've had, but mix in people that have uh, some higher incomes as well. Um, so here, you know, I spent a whole book talking about these, these kinds of things that I think are some of those more successful examples that we alluded to at the, at the beginning of the, of the, the session. Um, there has been a case where a place that was at least as distressed uh, and violent and, and mis, uh, mismanaged and misdesigned in all the ways as any of these others was brought back. Uh, it had elevators. It had all of these things that said you couldn't, uh, you couldn't do it. Uh, but they had strong residents, they had a strong design team, they had strong landscape architects that were working on it. They had a, a very strong group of uh, resident advocates. Um, and they, had, they did this um, before the HOPE 6 program, um, but spending 30 some odd million dollars in the 1980s. Uh, and most of the residents, two thirds of the residents returned. Um, and uh, the residents negotiated the right to fire the private management company with 30 days notice. <laughs> I mean, you know, how often does that happen? And they have that management company for 25 years now, and they have to rebid the contract uh, periodically. Um, there are other models that we just don't talk about anymore. Um, and, and one final one, uh, in North Beach in San Francisco, and I love the early, the early drawings of, of, the, of the plan here. Uh, this is where Fisherman's Wharf would be now, looking out towards Alcatraz from the, the, new, the new buildings that were built um, in early 1950s. Um, and, uh, and then uh, after this place starts collapsing, uh, it gets redeveloped as North Beach Place. Um, and they put back every last one of the 220 public housing units that were on the, the site. And then, um, because there would be accusations of, oh, you're consolidating poor people again, 
they added uh, and densified the site with an additional 112 units of tax credit housing that had uh, very stably employed households. Uh, and they added a uh, Trader Joe's supermarket here that the neighborhood was eager to have and a lot of off-site parking underneath and a series of businesses there. So this place is at the heart of tourist San Francisco, uh, walking distance from Fisherman's Wharf, across from the Hyatt Hotel at the turnaround of the Cable and Mason uh, cable car line that could have easily been uh, just more of the gentrification adds to the affordable housing uh, of the neighborhood. Um, you know, what are the pressures um, that allow San Francisco or Boston to do what they've done and not um, to give in to the easy temptations of using prime land uh, for people who may have uh, less urgent need for housing? Ultimately, it's really a question of, of picking a question to ask. Um, and I think the question that was asked in, in, it, in Atlanta, in Chicago, was the first one. How can the number of low-income households or very low-income households that need to be accommodated be kept to a minimum so that redevelopment will remain financially appealing to private developers and investors? But you could also ask a different question, and I think it's the question that's been asked in San Francisco and in Boston and some other cities. What's the maximum number of well-screened, very low-income households that can be accommodated in a mixed-income development while still ensuring a safe and attractive and stable community? Um, so if we're really interested in reducing displacement, to come back to that term, I'm hoping that more planners and more mayors and more designers are going to ask the second question instead of the first. So I'm happy to uh, uh, take any questions or comments, um, if, you, if, you, if you like. Fascinating story. Uh, I I wonder if in your research you follow the hope seats and by design, not everybody comes back. Mm -hmm. but except that San Francisco is hope six and everybody yes, could come back. Could come back to that one, but by design, because there are some people uh, that ten years ago 15 years ago, believed that you really cannot keep such a concentration of, uh, of uh, poverty, that it, you will never do anything that will make them emerge and join the mainstream. Um, the question uh, uh, with the OP6, the early OP6, Sure. 
and when to be in other places of their choosing. Yeah. Because that is a very good me measurement. Yeah. So I, I don't think return rate is the right measure only, and I would agree with Rene Glover and others that, that, that make that point. You know, um, it's not just that, but the problem is that if you don't count, if you don't start observing who is affected by this and start following those people and, and able to find out what their outcomes are, you can't really answer your really important question. Because for some people, getting a voucher and getting out and having that as a real choice um, is, uh, uh, is, is the best thing that could have happened. Um, and, uh, and to have a real choice, and if I were to give you my example from uh, Tucson, for instance, where they, uh, they had a relatively small return rate, but they did a terrific job of giving people really good options and showing them places uh, that had been uh, purchased, in some cases, new single-family homes and subdivisions uh, adjacent to transit and near good schools. And they said, would you rather wait through a, here on a construction site, we'll, we'll phase it and, uh, so that you could come back if you want, but here are some other things that you might want to consider. That's, that's called doing well by, by people. Um, if, you're, if you're only saying, uh, take a voucher and then some can't even use it, uh, or they completely lose their whole social network and uh, community, um, then it may not be uh, such a good I thing. Think, I think the voucher by itself, plus, plus assistance to the location, yep. is the right form. Yep. And Atlanta is trying to do that, you yeah. know, I mean, to be fair. Uh, and uh, they just haven't followed all of the people that have been affected by uh, what has transpired, and that's why there's been such anger uh, in the city. See, uh, why, do, why don't we get some more questions yeah. for for yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, great. Looking forward to reading the book. Uh, I, I was wondering whether you could uh, comment a little bit uh, more on the concept of uh, design politics, because I, I I saw in your presentation that uh, design politics is is, is, is maybe uh, manifesting itself in two different ways. One as a kind of proxy for an argument to make. Mm -hmm. One as a kind of enforcement, enforcement mechanism. Uh, how would you? Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's a, that's a really good question. I, um, I mean what I'm what I'm looking for are the ways that ideas and values are encoded into design artifacts. Whether it's a drawing, whether it's a um, a an implementation plan, uh, whether it's um, a, a unit mix, you know, so you, you um, uh, the, I didn't go into the story about the, the mixed income at North, uh, Northtown Village, but they, um, they had a big argument between the nonprofit developer, Holston, and the for-profit developer that was in charge of the market rate, a part of the housing, about what kind of open space to do. So the first drawing shows uh, top lots and um, Flash parks and is designed for young children, uh, and then they decided no, that's going to attract the the, the Carini residents uh, and their young children. We want a dog park, <laughs> and so they replaced it with a dog park. Um, so you have you know they didn't say we're here to cater to this group instead of this group. They didn't have to say that. They just did it, right? Um, uh, they did it through design. That's what I mean by, you know, that's the kind of thing I mean by design politics. Or, um, and, and that, the, the, the decisions about how many bedrooms to bring back of which kinds, you know, are really saying which kinds of families do you want? You know, these things that just look like uh, things that are part of uh, uh, an architectural program uh, in R uh, are also deeply encoded with, with social and political values about the community that you want and and the community that you don't want. Um, keeping in mind that these things are, are really very hard to, to manage. Um, uh, and uh, and the, some of these places that I think have been more successful are much smaller. You know, the San Francisco and the Boston example are not 3,600 units. Um, uh, not 1,500 like uh, Columbia Point uh, in Boston. Um, you know, those kinds of, of challenges uh, are much, much bigger. But, so what I want, you know, what I want to be able to do is to not sort of take design things over here and social and political and economic stuff over here, but to sort of see how they they actually uh, converge upon one another because they're they're not um, independent. 
Um, maybe one more question, and then because it's six o'clock now, and maybe we can um, huddle around Nari afterwards. Yeah. So it, just to be reactionary for a moment, if you imagine Chuck Palmer coming back or the, the white men in the authority coming in during the talk, it would seem like they could say, you're right, there were three experiments here. We did an experiment where we sorted based on who we wanted in this thing. And it was rough, but we did it, and it worked. We got a functioning community that was low income, not as low as it could have been, but it was a good place to live. And then the hippies came along and civil rights and all that, and we had to give up the sorting. And the whole place went to hell, and nobody benefited. Not the poorest of the poor, not the people living there, not anybody. You know, so yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly the question, and that's the that's the 350-year-old cultural question. You know, it's the question that the Puritans were worrying about when they thought they'd left the poor people behind in England and, and left the country. And, and and so the the question I would come back to is that, you know, what is the solution for the people that you can't house? Um, if you're trying to be Chuck Palmer or Rene Glover. Um, and, and is there a role for the government to be thinking about that? Or is there a role for the private sector to be thinking about that? Is there a role for nonprofits? Um, you know, what do we do about uh, the fact that, um, that culturally, deeply embedded, we as a society prefer to help the people who are one rung up from the bottom? So if Roosevelt said we, we have a nation, I see a nation, one, you know, one third ill house. Um, we're worrying about the fifth sixth instead of the sixth sixth. Right? Is, but is it possible yeah. that it's not that they didn't prefer to help the bottom, but they didn't think you could until they were one step up? Well, they denied that they weren't doing it. That was what was, yes. what, was what, what I find troublesome. <laughs> right. Is that they said we're here to get the very lowest income. But financially, unless the subsidies were going to be better and unless the political will was there, they weren't going to ever reach many of those people. And you know, and you don't want to have only the least advantaged people in, but but there are so many good examples that are under study of mixing low income and extremely low income. Or low moderate income and and, and very low income. You know, does it have to be market rate and and then the farthest extreme possible? You know, are there narrower mixes? We don't we've got a term called mixed income and it covers everything. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess we're, we're out of time, although Tony no, was trying to we, ask a question. Yeah, why don't yeah. we can yeah. take one more. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, given that New York City went a completely different route, they yeah. didn't mix and fix, they didn't tear down any floor, any high rise housing. How do you put that in this perspective? You know, yeah, right um, so I think that they, they did, they did once cleared communities rather than twice cleared communities. Right? They, they, there's certainly a lot of uh, purging the poorest in the first phase. Um, but they violated all the rules that, that various housing authorities uh, in Washington were trying to, to tell them. Uh, and they said, you know, we are not going to take the poorest of the poor. Uh, we are going to keep uh, a, a, an income mix in here, and we're going to make it well-maintained and well-landscaped and attractive to to people to want to say. And you know, so so they managed to, to do that at least until the last ten or fifteen years when it's become more more problematic in more more places. But it's fascinating to me that, that New York has almost entirely not torn down its public housing. Uh, and Chicago was trying to get rid of every last high rise except for some for the seniors. Um, and and so it's a management question, it's a it's a culture question of willingness to live in apartments and seeing other people who aren't stigmatized by living in apartments and high buildings. It's a, it's a wonderful job of landscaping um, that I think is often credited. And Nick Bloom spends a lot of time talking about landscape uh, in, in explaining the history of um, uh, success in, in New York. Um, but ultimately, you know, they did sort of what Ezra was suggesting would be a, a rational thing to do, which is to take advantage of having an ongoing demand uh, from the upwardly mobile working poor um, for that housing and to say yes. And yes, please come, please stay. Uh, and, um, but still, 
uh, you know, there, there's just not enough of this housing available um, for those of the, of the lowest incomes in these tight housing markets. And that's been you know, an ongoing problem. Um, and so I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to spend more time, or I'll be able to spend more time on looking at these successes and trying to explain whether they are replicable across different places. Um, because ultimately, I don't want to be telling stories about purges. I want to be telling stories about uh, communities that were able to resist them. And the Cabrini people did a whole lot better than they would if they had worse lawyers. There'd be a lot fewer of them there than there are now. But it's still not good enough. You know, and we don't have an answer to that fundamental question about where, uh, where should the lowest income people be able to live in, in our communities and in communities in other countries as well. Uh, and what is the role of the, of the state in, in helping uh, those people to help themselves uh, and to respect them and to develop in a more just manner? With that note, um, we'll say thank you. Professor.